She thought that was funny. All right, pay, uh, Psalm number 127. Psalms 127. <clears throat> Excuse me, goodness gracious. I'm going to whip this one way or another. Page Psalms, or page, Psalms 127. Amen. Boy, the Lord's been good, amen, this last week. Uh, it's just been exciting, and, and uh, you know, the Lord's really uh, just worked in, in my life, in my heart this week, but the devil's also been fighting, amen. And, uh, but praise the Lord, I love church, and I'm glad that you're here this morning. I'm going to have Brother Dotson come and read for us Psalms 127. We're, brother, if you'll read just uh, all five verses there, Psalms 127, all five verses. Brother Dotson is uh, kind of the... Uh, uh, of the Sunday school class, and as far as the structure goes, he's kind of the vice president. So if I'm ever not here, Brother Dotson would be the one that would teach the Sunday school class. I don't think I wouldn't be here, but you know, if something happens, you know, my wife gets angry and uh, and I don't show up because I I made her angry. No I'm kidding. But if anything were to happen, Brother Dotson would be the one to help me out there. But I'm going to have him read the the verse for us. We're going to read Psalms 127, uh, all five verses there, brother. You may be seated. All right, in the Sunday school hour, we've been uh, we've just started another uh, Sunday school series on the home on the rock, talking about building our homes on the rock of Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, we went we started last week. This is a continuation. Um, the I do's and the I don'ts of marriage, and uh, I believe that these are a help. I know in studying, they're a help to me. And uh, many men I know have. Uh, put these to practice, many families, and uh, they're a big help. And so we're going to talk some more uh, lesson two on this uh, series of the Home on the Rock. We start here in uh, Psalms 127, verse number one, and we see a principle that God gives us that we can use. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. The reason we're teaching on this is because we have to remember that if we don't get God involved in our homes, then we're laboring in vain. That's what the Bible says. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. If we don't get God involved, then all of your work, all of your labor, all the time and effort that you put into your children, into your family, all of it will just go down the drain. <clears throat> you might as well just flush it down the toilet, as we, as, as, so to speak. Why? Because we've got to have God involved. Now, it's not saying that if you, you know, for some that maybe just get saved and things that uh, all the work that they've done that that's it's it's not it's wasted and all God can take what you've done and God can make something out of it. It's kind of like for instance uh, I've tried to do some projects and I'm not a uh, a master at many things uh, like over here on the side of the building I'd have Brother Johnny help me put uh, put this thing up around on the side there because I could have tried. However, I don't know how far I would have gotten very well and because he was looking at it. I said, well, I think we could do it this way, this way, and this. And he looked at it and he goes, uh, no. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, I just worth to try. And, uh, it's, but doing it, he, the master, <laughs> so to speak, had to come along and help me uh, fix kind of what I had already started. God is the same way. Maybe you've not always had the Lord involved in your life, and maybe you're just kind of getting God involved. Well, what happens is God can take what you've done, and then God can make it better. Amen. Amen. So it's not saying that, well, everything I've done up till now has just been wasted. That's not true. Now, some of it is, because in our lives, when we live outside of God's will, some things we do, we do out of the lust of the flesh. We do out of the de for the devil. You know, the Bible talks about that. We do for ourselves. Those things are wasted. But the structure of your home, God can take and rebuild and use what's there. Amen. God can always, God's not going to take and, and start all over. Amen. God just takes what you've given to Him, what you have right now, and builds that up. 
But we've got to get God involved. If we continue leaving God out, then we're in a mess, amen, and we'll end up in a mess. So we're going to talk again, uh, just some pointers uh, on, on this. Now we're going to go over to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. The book of Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to read in verse uh, 20, uh, or verse 21, Ephesians 5, 21. <clears throat> the Bible says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Ephesians chapter 5 is the marriage chapter. If you want to know the roles in marriage, you read Ephesians chapter 5. You can read it over and over and over. A couple things we learn is that, number one, in our study this morning, number one, realize that marriage is not an agreement, but a commitment. We have to start out with realizing, in God's eyes, your marriage is not an agreement between the two of, the two of you. Your marriage is a commitment. God says here that the wife is to submit to their own husbands and the husbands to love the wives. It's not saying that the husband doesn't have to love the wife if the wife doesn't do what he thinks she should do. It's not a, I will do if you do, and I won't if you won't, so to speak. And sometimes, uh, you know, we get in that mindset where, well, if they're not going to do this, then I'm not going to do this. God says it's not how marriage works. Marriage is a commitment. When you say, I do, to that person, you're saying, you're making a commitment to God first, and then you're making a commitment to your spouse. To do what? To hold up your end of the bargain. Amen. To Ephesians chapter 5. Here, would you like me to find it? Yes. Here, I'll, I'll do that. Let me see. No, that's all right. Here, how about this? Oh, there you, thank you, brother. Ephesians chapter 5. Not a problem. Amen. Good. Remind me after, I'll get you a, a different Bible that you can use, and I'll show you that. Okay, Ephesians chapter 5. So, again, marriage is a commitment, not an agreement. Don't look at your marriages, and that's why, there, that's why divorce is so common, because divorce... The, because what happens is couples get to this point where they're saying, well, they're not holding up their end of the bargain, so I'm just going to leave. And God says when you get married, you're committing to that spouse. You're committing also to God. You're saying, God, I will treat her right. I will stay faithful, whether or not she does. That's what God did to us. God says as Christ loved the church, Jesus loves us, and he committed himself to us. Whether we're faithful to him or not, we're saved. Jesus doesn't say, well, you're not being faithful. Yes, I'm going to take away salvation. Amen. Praise God he doesn't do that. Right. God says that's supposed to be the same way between a husband and wife. If maybe there gets to a time where, the, where one of the spouses is not what they should be. We're all human. Amen. I know I'm not always what I should be for my wife. And thankfully, my wife is as forgiving as the Lord is, and she says... I still love you, and she still remains who she should be. That's how we ought to be. We have to look at it as, you may not always be what you should be, but I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. Amen. So uh, realize it's a commitment. Amen. Number two, between a husband and wife, uh, never spurn uh, your mate's desire for affection. In other words, treat your mate the way it should be. Never treat your spouse in a way that you would look at later and, say, and have to say, I'm sorry. You want to go, now, it does, now we, we fail, and, uh, we, and we all have those times where we uh, get into the flesh a little bit. But let's read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you go back a few, chapter, uh, a few uh, books there, you'll run right into 1 Corinthians. You'll find 2 Corinthians, and then you find 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number five, or 1 through 5 here. It says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power over of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. 
Defraud ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again that Satan, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. That uh, portion of scripture there is talking about how that between a husband and wife's relationship, you should never, uh, never uh, put away the, never, never turn away your uh, spouse's uh, affection. Never stop showing affection. Never stop giving affection. And maybe they, you say, well, they're not being what they should be, so I'm not going to love them like I should. And God says, never do that. Amen. Your, your, your spouse deserves the affection. When she said or he said, I do, amen, you said, I will. And, the, and realize that commitment is also to give them the affection that they need. You never withhold yourself from a spouse just because, well, they're not being who they should be. You always, you, you always be willing to forgive and be willing to have love and compassion. Because what happens is, like it said, you, if you're not careful, then bad things can happen because the, the, the husband or the wife begins to look for that affection somewhere else if we're not careful. Amen. So that's why it's very important. Now, uh, number three. Another principle that uh, we learn here is do not get too close to another couple. Do not get too close to another couple. What I'm saying there is this. In your life, your best friend should be your spouse. Amen. My best friend is my wife, and it has to be that way. If we are not careful, we get to where we do the same thing with a couple over and over and over, and we get to get too familiar. Your wife should be the only one that is the most familiar with you, or wife, your husband should be the only one that is familiar with you. Never share your feelings or your emotions, all of those things, with somebody of the opposite gender other than your wife. You keep that for her. Because what happens is, and this has happened, and I've seen it happen, where couples get too close to each other, and the man gets too close to another man's wife, and the wife, or the wife gets too close to another wife's husband, and there's unfaithfulness. It happens. So you want to guard your marriage by not letting yourself get too comfortable with somebody else. Now, nothing wrong with going and eating and having fun. And I, I love to do that. We love to go eat. We love to go uh, play games, things like that. We used to uh, do that back home. Larry and Emily, they're a, a couple at our church. They're our age. And we used to, but we did not do all the time. It was, we wanted to be more at home. Uh, with each other than we did want to be with other people. I don't understand couples that always want to be with others and never want to be by themselves. doesn't make sense. When you got married, you didn't say, I'm going to get married and spend my time with everybody else. You got married to spend time with your spouse. Amen. So spend time together. Don't, get, don't spend too much time with other couples. If you do, vary, vary your, uh, your company. So you say, you know, we do enjoy spending time or help, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. So what you do is you vary your, your company. You know, don't always be with the same person because then what happens is you, there, there, there can be clicks that go on or people feel, people feel upset because, well, you know, they're always together and they're not included, things like that. So you want to spend time together, and if you do spend time with others, vary your company. Keep that variety there, but the only person you should be absolutely close to is your spouse. Now, number four, the next thing we, 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 can, we can learn here. Do not run with single people of either gender. That's right. In other words, this, not saying, like, I love to go play basketball. It's not saying I can't go uh, play basketball with a bunch of guys at the park or something. Uh, I don't always do that. I'm, I, usually schedule, my schedule is very busy. But I, I'm not, you know, I'm not object to when I go down to Longview, some of those guys in college, they'll ask me to play basketball, and I'll do that. It's nothing like that. But what it means is when you're single, there's a lot of things that single people do. They go here, they go there, they, they, they get together, things like that. You know, they're always, you know, every, every day doing some things like that. Those are the types of activities we're talking about. When you got married, your priority is to your wife and your family first. A lot of times what happens is there's, and I'm not saying this is true here, I'm just Again, just going down a list of things to keep in mind, to, not, to guard yourself against. But a lot of times what can happen is we uh, get to where we start being single again in our mindset, forgetting that, well, I have a wife and a family first. And then our wives and our family and our children get neglected because 
we want to go hang out with all the old buddies or we want to go hang out with all the old uh, girlfriends and thing, you know, the, for ladies they do things like that, you know. Uh, but your, your, your priority should be to your spouse. Many marriages get into trouble because one or both spouses want the privileges of marriage and the privileges of single life. This is dangerous. No one has the right to enjoy the privileges of both. When you get married, you gained new privileges that you did not have when you were single. And to get those privileges, you traded the privileges of a single life. Don't try to hold on to those privileges or you'll seriously damage your marriage. And this is true for both the man as well as the woman. In other words, don't try to hold on to what you did when you were single and what you do now that you're married. You let go of single life and you allow yourself to be to your wife or your husband. And especially do not run. And, and if you do spend time with single people, and nothing wrong again with here and there, but never, especially when you're married, you shouldn't do this when you're single, but especially when you're married, never run with people of the, op, just if it's the opposite gender. So if you're going out and you maybe you go play basketball or something or whatever, and a bunch of women decide to tag along, don't do it. Right. Amen. Because then what happens is you get to be in familiar again. And uh, I've had times where, especially uh, I, 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 where I've been in places uh, in, in Hutchinson, they used to have an Elmdale uh, where you could go play basketball and a bunch, of, a bunch of ladies would walk in and things. And I would just leave because there was, just, there, was, there was something wrong. You ever just get that feeling like something's not right? Amen. Be careful. Uh, allowing your allowing single people of the opposite gender always have your wife around amen I always try to uh, include my wife if there's ever mixed company because it keeps you uh, it keeps you committed to each other but it keeps you uh, on guard as well so anyway the number five something else we learn put your mate before your children put your mate before your children in your married life you committed yourself to your spouse your children come along and, uh, well, and it, back up, you get married, you have a close and a romantic relationship with each other. And then a child comes, and there are uh, responsibilities that you have to your children. But remember that the child eventually will leave. Children eventually will be gone. All that will be left is the two of you again. And if you've not established a relationship with each other, then when all the children are gone, and you put your children first and everything, then it's you and your wife, and you go, where do we start? But that's why you want to keep that relationship going even while you have children. Put your mate before your children. Take time, a husband, to acknowledge your wife and wife to acknowledge your husband. And, and again, don't forsake the priorities of your children, but don't allow your children to come before your spouse. Children ought to know that mom loves dad and dad loves mom and that when dad is going to do something with mom, that that's important. Amen. We don't, you don't say we're going to have a date night on Thursday night and then change it because, well, something came up with the kids. You know, now emergencies are different. But make that priority. If you make the priority to your spouse, put the spouse before your children. If you're not careful, you'll build your life around your children, and then the children leave, and the couple will find that they have nothing else in common now that the children are gone. Because you built both of your lives around your children. And this is why sometimes couples get older, and they're not as close, and they almost have to start over. Because they built their lives around children. Always remember in your marriage, you have committed yourself to that spouse. And though your children are very precious, you never allow them to be more precious to you than your mate. Amen. Never allow them to be more precious to you. There's priorities. You know, we want to keep that. Your wife, your husband, they're your main priority. You're committed yourself to them for a lifetime. And then you have your children. You love your children. But children ought to always know that mom comes first or dad comes first. Amen. So we always want it to be that way. And, uh, and, and be careful doing that. Now, up uh, to the next part here. A couple other things we learn real quick. Put your mate before your parents. Most of us are very familiar with this. Again, I'm not saying that we, any, anybody has problems with this because uh, I believe that everybody's very familiar, but these are good just principles to go over to remind ourselves. Put your mate before your parents. Never allow your parents uh, to make the decisions for your home. 
Amen. You're a, you're a husband and wife. The Bible says uh, in Genesis 2.24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Amen. We're clearly told in the Bible to love and honor our parents. But when we have committed ourselves to another in marriage, our mates then take priority in all earthly relationships. Your mate has to know that neither the children nor your parents will come before them in your affection and your commitment. Many times, strife develops in a home when parents try to help their children run their lives in their marriage. Helpful tips would be uh, listen and do not be disrespectful to your parents, but make sure that your mate understands that you will only do that which is in the best interest of your home, with the utmost consider consideration being to your mate. This should be settled early on in your marriage. Again, uh, something that you know we uh, that many are probably familiar with, but just as a reminder, Amen. It's your home, Amen. And uh, when you leave mom and dad, uh, no longer do they run the marriage. You make the decisions between the two of you. Uh, I can remember uh, first, you know, uh, and, and and I don't mean to. I just, like, I just use sometimes my experiences, and, uh, and you probably find them funny because many of you could probably teach this lesson uh, better than I could. But I remember when we first got married, that's a tough adjustment, you know, for when it, my wife and I. That was kind of tough because, you know, no longer do mom and dad run the show. You know, I'm used to so long saying, you know, mom and dad, what do you think? And then, yes. You know, now they're my advisors, no longer my authority. You know, I'm the authority. I make the decisions. And then I thought that was cool. I'm the authority. And then I found out I was really just listening to them and and not making the decisions I was it, I was really you know my wife it was just let me tell you it was a funny 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 time I don't know if anybody had any experiences like that but my wife and I we had a good time and uh, she had a good time reminding me of that of the of these things it was funny but put your mate before your parents number uh, the next thing go out on a weekly date with your mate I would advise every couple to make a time where you can go on some kind of a date. You may not be able to do it weekly, uh, but you should try. I think that it's good for every couple to have a scheduled time that they spend doing something together. And uh, even if, and it doesn't have to be expensive, uh, but just some time, somehow, if you can, spend time together uh, alone, you know, if you can. Uh, a lot of times for uh, us, uh, my parents live uh, in Hutchinson, so we don't get to be able to do that much more anymore. But we take Adeline with us. But I try to, as much as I can, spend time with my wife. So, like, if the if, what my my thing now is when Adeline's asleep, that's when we try to spend time alone. I put the phone away, I put the computer away, I put all the office work away, you know, and have that time where she takes her nap, and I just give that to my wife. You know, I try to do that. And and, and first. For each of us, we all have different schedules. We all have different things. But make something to where your wife or your, uh, especially for the men, do it for your wife's sake. Make a time to where they can look forward to that nothing will interfere. Biggest thing, I think, for ladies is they want that one-on-one -on -one time. You know, they don't want, you know, my wife always gets frustrated at me because then, uh, and I, and I laugh because I, I'm not thinking about it. But, you know, if something comes up on the phone, I look at an email. And she's like, um, I was talking to you. I was like, oh, yeah, what'd you say? <laughs> and she kind of laughs and is like, yeah, that's what I thought. You know? And so sometimes in this busy world, we get in such a busy mindset to where we begin to not realize we neglect each other. And so take time with each other. Get rid of the cell phones. Get rid of the TV. Get rid of the computer. Get rid of everything and talk. Amen. This will help to encourage, like I said, to put your mate before your children that way, when, you, when the children are gone, you can keep up with this weekly date. But you continue to build that relationship. Amen. Next thing here. Get ready to be done. One should care for the couple's uh, finances, and the other should live on an allowance. Uh, this is uh, another recommendation that a big problem in marriage comes a lot of time because of finances. Uh, finances become a problem, a strife. And so one of the couples should be in charge of, uh, uh, of handling all the finances. For, for, uh, for us, I do all the financing, and I tell Sarah, you have this much to spend. Uh, sometimes she calls and goes over, but, you know, she, but I have her call me. That way I know what's going on. To help you save problems, especially for in a younger marriage, 
have, a t have somebody that handles that finances, and sometimes this can be the wife in some cases, that handles that finance that shows this is what we have, and then the other lives on that allowance. Because what happens is you go to spend, bo both parties go to spend money, and money gets spent somewhere where it shouldn't be, and somebody puts money in somewhere, and both think that this is my money, and all of it. No. Amen. It can be, it can be tough. If you need help sometimes with a budget, uh, you know, I would, I, you can ask. Uh, there's great people, even in the church, that are great with budgeting that you can ask for help and opinion. I've done that many times, asking help with a budget, things like that, if you're, if for younger couples and things. But work on living on that allowance, amen, and that'll help you save and budget and pay bills and things like that. And then the last thing here, apply to your mate all Bible verses about the treatment of others. Romans chapter 12, verse number 10. This is probably the big one we'll spend just a little bit of time on. The rest of these are just suggestions and, uh, and advice to maybe help in maybe areas where you say, well, we struggle with this. this these are good things to uh, be principal. But this one here, this is not an option. This is something we all uh, should heed and take it and, and, and listen to. You should apply to your mate every Bible verse that talks about how you should treat others. A lot of times what happens is if we're not careful, we begin to think that I can treat my wife differently than I treat everybody else. Romans chapter 12, verse number 10. The Bible says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. A lot of problems come in the home because the husband or the wife is shows more kindness to people outside of the home and then when they get home they're rude or they're short they're not patient and the wife begins to think well you're patient with everybody else why aren't you just as patient with me or the husband thinks you're as patient with everybody else why aren't you as patient as I am or as you are with me you to apply every Bible verse when it talks about treating others that's how you are to treat your spouse don't think of it in your mind, well, I live with her so I can treat, or I live with him so I can treat them different than I treat everybody else. And this is why we do that, because we don't want to hurt our image with everybody else, but they have to live with us. It doesn't matter. Well, they have to accept me for who I am. I want to make sure everybody else thinks I'm a super spiritual Christian, but my wife lives with me so I can just treat her how I want to, or my husband. We have to be careful of that. Amen. Be careful at getting into that mindset. In Romans 12.10, it talks about being kindly affectioned one to another. Be kind to each other. And in honor, prefer one another. So in other words, you should take time to, if you have something that you would like to do and your wife would like to do, as a husband, we ought to prefer to do what our wives want to do. We prefer to one another. And we take time for each other. Uh, it, it, but, we're, but we're kindly affection. Be kind to each other. Take the same kindness that you would treat anybody else with and be that kind to each other. Romans chapter 12, verse 18 says this. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Live peaceably. So not only be kind to each other, but try to live in your home with as much peace as possible. Amen. When, we come, when you come to church or when you go to work, you do the best that you can to keep problems at a minimum. Do that in your home. Do the best that you can to keep peace. Live peaceably. Every time you get home should not be another argument. Every time you get home should not be, well, here we go again. Amen. Uh, put your boxing gloves on. Here we go. All right. Round two. What's up? Now live peaceably with each other. Amen. That takes effort. Everybody thinks that peace is just, you know, this is, it's just easy stuff, just comes, you know, it's just, you know, peace. Hey, peace takes work. Peace takes war. <laughs> Can't have peace without fighting for something. So I'm not saying, now I'm not saying fight each other, but I'm saying you're going to have problems. So you have to, as a result, let that problem end in living peaceably and not let it go on and go on and go on. Make problems at a minimum. Ephesians 4.32 says, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Here we see a couple principles. 
We talked about being kind one to another already, but then we see tender-hearted. Be tender-hearted. Be you know, tender towards your wife. Be tender towards your spouse. A lot of times we, we, get, we get too rough. Let's be tender. Let's take time to put our arms around each other. Let's take time to think of each other. Let's take time to be tender towards when they're hurt. Sometimes, you know, uh, and, and I know this is true for me, that late, I, I did not realize as a young man late how emotional ladies can be. Amen. To me, I thought, man up. <laughs> but I had to learn... And I know that, and I probably should have asked advice from some of you because y'all are great. Some of you are better at this than I am about being tender-hearted, taking time to say what's wrong. <laughs> I didn't know we do that. <laughs> I just thought that ah, should be fine. <laughs> Take time to be tender towards each other. The wife, the husband, ought to be tender-hearted toward his wife. The husband ought, ought to take time to help his wife, ought to take time helping her to the car, opening up the door, uh, making her feel as special as what she really is. A lot of times we're more tender-hearted and compassionate to others, and we're not as tender towards each other. Okay, And then next, forgiving one another. Be forgiving to each other. In a husband-wife relationship, sometimes if we're not careful, we tend to forgive others more than we forgive each other because we get used to each other. We get familiar, and so we begin to not forgive because we realize there's more. We realize the problems that are there. You live with somebody long enough, you're going to learn all of their idiosyncrasies. You're going, to leave, you're going to learn all of their weaknesses, all of their problems. And you have to treat your marriage like Christ treats us. Jesus gets to know us and still forgives us. Jesus knows every one of your problems. Knows the, how many, he even knows the number of the hairs on your head. For some of you, it's not as many. <laughs> knows everything about you. But yet, he still forgives you every time you say, Lord, please forgive me. A husband and wife ought to do the same. When you learn your wife's weaknesses, you learn your husband's weaknesses, forgive one another. Don't hold that against them. Well, if you would do this, then I could do this. God says, now forgive one another. Be willing to forgive. So you fail. You have that shortcoming. You have that moment. You have that time where for the husband, you lose your temper. You blow up. Or for the wife, maybe you burnt the toast. Or maybe if the man cooks, you burn the toast. Oh, no. I tried cooking, but I let my wife do it. She's better at it than I am. You fail. You come, you come short. Forgive one another. Forgiving, I believe, is the biggest key in a marriage. Most marriages would be solved. Most marriage problems would be solved if we would just forgive each other. The problem is we, have the pro we, we, we tend to hold problems. And we hold it against each other. Well, how dare they? They should get that right. Yes, but you know what? Sometimes you're more spiritual than your spouse. Sometimes you can be more spiritual than your spouse. And you have to help your spouse along even in their spiritual walk. That's where you have to forgive one another. And then we see, uh, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You're to treat your spouse as Jesus has treated you. Treat your spouse as Jesus has treated you. Jesus has forgiven us. He loves us. He's long-suffering. He's patient. He's kind. He's tender-hearted. All of those things Jesus is to you. You have no right to turn around and treat your spouse any different. Amen. Apply those to your spouse. Take time to, take, take time to love your spouse. Take time to say, I'm sorry. I think the most two neglected words, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. As men, sometimes we like to not like to have to say those words. I'm sorry. Amen. Take time to say I'm sorry. Love each other. Amen. All of these verses, and there's many more. These are just a few of them. You can keep going. Many more that talk about how you treat others. Even uh, talking about like the one that says, uh, He that hath friends must show himself friendly. Sometimes we're more, uh, we're more inclined to be friendly towards everybody else, but we're not as friendly to our spouse. We kinda, and what we kind of do is we leave our spouse in the dirt. And then we get home, and then we just go about our business, tech, look at our phones, check the TV, what's going on with sports, look at the work emails, things like that. And we leave the spouse to what they're, whatever they're doing. Take time for each other. 
I want, our, I want the marriages in the church to be able to be strong, and that starts with treating each other as Christ has treated us. Amen. This world has gotten so busy with technology. This world has gotten so busy with schedules in life, and you are busy. But take time to prioritize and give, give yourself to each other. Many marriages and churches fall apart. Even, in, even with pastors, and I be, I've begged to God when I got married and God put me in the ministry that I wouldn't make that mistake because it's so easy to fall into, that, we wouldn't, that I wouldn't put the ministry before, I, before my wife. That's why I like when we go handshaking things. I try to go see my wife and kiss her, tell her I love her, things like that. I want her to know that I love her, amen, because she's got to know that, and, she's got, and I've got to know that she loves me, amen. And we can't do what God wants us to do if we're not right with each other. Same it is for everyone else. You'll never be able to do what God wants you to do if you don't stay right with each other, if you don't love each other, forgive each other, treat each other correctly. Problems are going to come. Mark it down. You got married, problems will come. Why? You're both sinners. You did not marry a perfect spouse. Although my wife keeps telling me I'm perfect, and I believe her. She did marry perfectly. No. Problems will come. You're both sinners. Realize problems are going to keep coming. You'll never be rid of problems till the day that you die. But the difference is how you handle those problems. Live peaceably. Forgive each other. Don't treat your wife any different than what you would treat a stranger. Don't treat your wife any different than what you would treat somebody that's uh, that's a friend to you. A lot of times it, that's what happens. And, and, and also, do not treat, and this is a, another big one, then we'll be done. Do not treat you, uh, somebody more affectionately than your own spouse. So in other words, don't, don't take time and, and not love your spouse, but then when somebody else comes along, you're more patient, you're more friendly, you're more kind, you're more loving to them. That causes two problems. Number one, it causes insecurity in the spouse. Number two, familiarity between another spouse can cause in, in, unfaithfulness. If you're not careful and you're willing to show more desire and affection to somebody else than you are to your, to your spouse, then that should be a red flag. Why don't I treat my wife better than I treat somebody else? Let that be a red flag to you. I would say this. I would, I would rather you come and just walk around with your wife all the time than you to not treat your spouse because they, your spouse has to know you love them. Amen. Your spouse has to know. Your spouse has to know that you're dedicated to them. We get... We get to where, if we're not careful, we get too familiar. Amen. Love each other. Amen. Do things together. And I just uh, encourage you for that because that's what will make a strong marriage. I am not an expert on marriage, but I'm an expert on the Bible. I study the Bible. I study God's Word. And I can tell you, I've seen it even firsthand, and, I'm, and I've not been in the ministry long, but I've watched my father for many years, and this has happened time and time again, and I've watched, uh, I've watched divorces. I've seen families, and, ha and divorces happen and even in churches. Don't think you're above it. I've watched a family with three and four children leave, and those children are destroyed because a husband and wife could not forgive. Because a husband treated, a treated another lady better than he treated his wife. And unfaithfulness occurred. Be careful, amen. Love your wife. Treat her special. Ladies, treat your husband special. Make sure you give your first, your first love and affection to them. Now, of course, and forgive me, but always make sure you put the Lord first. I mean, you've got to put God first. If God's not first, like we said, except the Lord build the house. Your love and commitment has to be to God first. I read a book this week talking about a great man of God named John R. Rice. And his wife said, John, they were traveling down the road. And she said, John, do you love me? 
And he said, yes, dear. She said, why do you love me? He says, because God told me to. And she says, well, John, that doesn't turn me on. And he said, well, it won't turn me off. <laughs> he was teaching a principle there. He said, honey, I love you because I'm committed to the Lord first. And if, if you're committed just to your spouse, when your spouse fails, that commitment will leave. That's what happens outside of the house of God. People are committed to each other for a time, and then they fail, and then they think, well, time to move on. If you commit to God first, it doesn't matter how your wife fails or how your husband fails, your commitment's to God first to, st to be faithful. And you'll never leave each other. You'll have a happy marriage. Amen. God says you will uh, have a blessed home. God will put his hand of blessing upon that home. Put a hedge of protection upon a home. I read a great poem. I told you I'd be done. I'm sorry. Great poem one time talking about marriage takes three. Amen. A lot of times we, we begin to neglect and we think, well, marriage takes a husband and wife. Marriage takes three. It takes you, your wife, and God. If you don't have all three of those involved in your marriage, your marriage will never last. Amen. Get God involved. Amen. Be in church. Take time to come Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Be involved with church, putting God first with each other and then putting each other first and then your children. And you watch as you prioritize your marriage that God will bless you. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we sure do love you. Thank you, Lord. For